Please welcome Mahesh Ramanajam, Chief Operating Officer, USGBC. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, that's better. Uh, it's great to see all of you here at the Greenbelt International Summit in the home ground, Washington, D.C. First, uh, let me thank all of you for joining us here today, um, particularly with all the travel schedules, each and every one of you having your busy schedules. You are here, and we are very, very delighted. Um, just walking into the room, I saw many familiar faces. I feel at home. And uh, it's going to be a very, very good day. So thank you again. Today morning, at this start, I'll share some perspectives uh, from where uh, we have been working for the past uh, five years. And uh, you will see and hear throughout the conference how USGBC and GBCI and GRES and everything else that we've been working on for the past five years is actually transforming the world. Every story about a green building is a story about people. But at USGBC, we say every story about a lead building is a story about leaders. Leaders across the globe, like yourselves, recognize that lead works and enhances the company's triple bottom line on people, planet, and profits. LEAD also helps manage business operations and creates a more sustainable, resource-efficient built environment. By certifying their buildings to LEAD, leaders across the world are raising the bar for the global market. Over the last two years, we have had the pleasure of traveling around the world and meeting so many of you. And you have offered us tremendous hospitality. Thank you so much for that. But during these travels, what has been interesting is we have seen LEAD everywhere. LEAD is in use more than 150 countries and territories, and the international demand for LEAD is constantly growing. Once again, we announced the leaderboard for 2015. The top 10 states in the United States and top 10 countries who use LEAD around the world. Canada, China, and India are leading the way. So the rest of the nations, please catch on. You have an opportunity to make it to the leaderboard. Last year, we launched our, we launched our latest version of LEAD, the LEAD V4, which significantly raises the bar on performance and sets a quantum leap benchmark for sustainability. Performance is the future. Our LEAD dynamic plaque now has more than 84 million square feet of certified space and 350 projects, and it is also growing constantly. Over the last year, GBCI, which I am proud to serve as the president, has grown significantly as well to administer and credential, certify and credential, lead, edge, sites, peer, and the well building standard. We have seen impressive progress on the international front and our international strategy is working. For GRESP, it was another successful year. The numbers will tell the story. We have now 51 investors, $6.1 trillion of institutional capital, 707 participants, 61,000 assets, totaling a property value of $2.3 trillion. And these numbers are not small. And GRESP also launched their version for infrastructure this year so that we can actually transfer the investment potential from real estate to actually infrastructure. Partnership is a new leadership. This year, we have a few more exciting announcements to make on a variety of partnerships that we have been able to start. Notably, two of them that I would like to call it out today morning. In October, USGBC, GBCI and Delhi Metro Rail Corporation, a renowned institution in India, have signed a groundbreaking agreement to actually certify all existing and new metro stations throughout the country using LEED and eventually 
globally. Today, USGBC and GBCI and International World Building Institute will be shortly signing an agreement with Shogong Corporation, a China's largest steel company and a Fortune 500 company, to incorporate LEED, WELL, and other green building rating systems into the new mixed use development on an old site that spans over 833 hectares. Shogong's mission is to create the world's greenest city. Finally, in partnership with a variety of you, we are creating a vision for smart eco-cities that will revolutionize the way the cities are built, retrofitted, and operated, improve the quality of life of citizens across the globe, and stimulate a robust green economy. Everything that we have accomplished so far is working all over the world. Together, we have made a global commitment to building sustainably. Together, we are achieving the speed to market transformation for our built environment, and by extension, strengthening the people and, it, and the planet. To me personally, it feels like the lights went on suddenly. The sustainability movement is on fire. And thanks to all of you. Your leadership is what is truly making this happen. And you're leading us from the front. And we are very fortunate to follow your footsteps. Thank you so much. Now, I'd like to introduce a leader who I am especially proud of. It is my pleasure to welcome Mary Malmo, Vice President, UTC Climate, Controls, and Security. UTC is globally recognized for its leadership in environmental stewardship and its focus on the delivery of environmentally responsible energy efficient systems, services, and solutions. When talking about UTC, and Mary in particular, it's important to recognize and applaud the pivotal leadership and partnership they have provided to USGBC. UTC was the first member of USGBC and has stayed continuously engaged as our founding sponsor for the Center for Green Schools and have been constantly involved in the evolution of Greenbelt and offered thought leadership through their provocative and impressive career distinguished sustainability lecture series. Mary, a perfectionist, has provided a clear and a distinct voice in all of our shared and successful endeavors. Please join me in welcoming my friend, Mary Malmo. Well, thank you, Mahesh. He's a perfectionist. I try to hide that, actually. So. Um, I'm thrilled to be here on behalf of United Technologies Climate Control and Security um, and to welcome you to this Green Build International Summit. Before I begin, I would like to just say our thoughts and our prayers are with all of those affected by the Paris terror attacks, particularly the friends and the families of the victims. As an international community, we have all felt the impact of these senseless and tragic events. As the details continue to unfold, we will stand in solidarity with the people of France and all of us in this room, I know, carry a spirit of hope with us as we reflect and heal. Turning to our summit, this is the 10th time that I've been at Greenbuild. Um, and every year I'm excited and I'm energized to see the momentum, to learn about the latest trends and to reflect on the progress of green buildings. The progress that we've all made, all of you have made in this room together is impressive and incredible. Carrier, a United Technologies company, has been the presenting sponsor of the International Summit since the very beginning, and we're very proud to carry that tradition again this year. Green buildings are high performance buildings, and they're steadily becoming the new norm. The market suspects and expects sustainable, efficient, smart buildings and all of us in this room can design and construct those buildings. The technology and the know-how is at our fingertips. Um, and thanks to the passion and the commitment of so many, we've seen an amazing step change over the last two decades. We're thrilled to sponsor the International Summit as we know the demand for green buildings 
is not limited to a certain country or a certain region. It is truly global. And by bringing together the professionals from more than 30 countries that are represented here in this room, I know that this event provides the opportunity for us to further connect, exchange ideas, best practices, and learn about the latest green building strategies. The people you meet here today obviously are your peers from around the world, and I know that I will be taking advantage, and I'm sure all of you will be taking advantage of the opportunity to discuss the opportunities, the challenges, the successes that we are all seeing around the world to continue the momentum that USGBC and each of the Green Building Councils that are represented here today and at the conference um, are motivating. Today's program also features insights from leading voices um, to a broad range of global issues, all of which impact the world around us. Um, ultimately, the collective steps that we, we take really, really do make a difference. We see the change. I know each of you are seeing the change in your countries and in your regions and in your locations. So thank you for all you do. There's so much more opportunity ahead of us and enjoy the International Summit. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. I told you it's going to be a great day. It's a good lineup. Uh, now I get to introduce another great leader, a fellow Indian, and my mentor, Dr. M. Ramachandran. Dr. Ramachandran, a very well known, very well known in India as the infrastructure man, last served as the secretary, Ministry of Urban Development and in Government of India. Dr. Ramachandran carries an illustrious academic record an outstanding career in coveted and prestigious Indian administrative services, and an insatiable intellectual and developmental pursuit. Dr. Ramachandran's career with Government of India spanned four decades of diverse exposure and experience, wherein he rose to the highest levels of the federal and the state governments. The story of urbanization and infrastructure development in India cannot be complete without, without listing the immense contributions of Dr. Ramachandran personally in his official capacity, and now as a thinker and influencer. We are fortunate to have him as our senior advisor on the smart eco-city vision for India and for the rest of the world, Dr. Ram Chandra. Thank you, Mahesh. Um, this is one occasion when uh, one feels too small listening to all those um, uh, plaudits you, you shared on me. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we have uh, this panel today. We have uh, three eminent panelists uh, on the topic of uh, scaling up foundations of a sustainable economy. Uh, it seems it's in the fitness of things that we are focusing on this particular topic especially at a time when cities are expanding all over. There are issues specific to countries, regions. But urbanization now is accepted as one of the most uh, influential realities of the present century. The degree may vary. If I may specifically refer to the Indian context, the India's urban population is the second largest in the whole world. We have something like 8,000 cities and towns with varying population ranges. Rapid urbanization is now raising a number of first-time complex issues threatening the sustainability of cities, which includes urbanization of poverty, degradation of natural resources resulting from extensive land use changes, and increased greenhouse gas emissions. Understanding on these challenges it's only building up slowly. And we always have this issue of um, how do cities cope with this requirement in a given context where, on the one hand, they are struggling with the day-to-day -day requirements, providing basic services, and at the same time be aware of what needs to be done for the city as far as the future is concerned in terms of uh, sustainability. Planning sustainable cities calls for a review of urban planning practices and approaches discussion on resource constraints and conflicts, and identification of innovative approaches that are more responsive to current and future 
urbanization challenges. This would require mainstreaming and sustainability tenets into planning and development policies and guidelines as a first step. And this is likely to increase sustainability of our urban areas. Another important aspect is addressing the needs of the poor. This gains importance considering that around 40% of urban India is concentrated in the bottom income brackets. Rapid demogra demographic growth in, uh, in and around India's urban areas are changing the physical dimensions of the city, such as its size, shape, density, land use, layout, and building types. A complex mixture of numerous characteristics, including infrastructure and transportation. Much of the debate about urban sustainability focuses on increasing densities, mixing land use, and containing urban sprawl to achieve social and eco-diversity and vitality characterized as the compact city. Those who are following the India agenda would have come across some very interesting terms like smart city, sustainable city. There is a huge mission launched by the federal government of India to create what could be called 100 smart cities. And I think that provides opportunities for those who are interested in working with India. There are other programs which have been taken up by the federal government, because in the Indian context, when the federal government takes the initiative, the states fall in line, and the cities find an avenue of uh, taking advantage of that resource flow, which is substantially there from the federal government. Housing for all is an agenda which has been taken up by the current government, and there is a target set for the year 2022, when something like 20 million households have to be provided with houses. Now, migration into cities creates problems. One of the typical problems we face is uh, the cities are not mandated to take up housing at their own level. Neither will it be possible for them to do so. So it's a question of a joint endeavor between the federal government, the state government, and also the city governments as to how to provide housing for all those. So while on the one hand, there are issues like providing these basics, at the same time, there are initiatives being taken to look at some of the more relevant issues, addressing them as far as uh, creating sustainable cities are concerned. I thought I'll briefly refer to that Indian context so that since we have an eminent panel representing different parts of the globe, uh, we have this in our discussion scheme of things. As I mentioned, we have uh, three eminent panelists here. The first one is Harriet Chagoni, who leads the Office of Community Planning and Development at the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. She recently led HUD's Office of Economic Resilience, helping regions, cities, counties, and towns across the country build a strong foundation for a diverse and prosperous state. She was previously director of the District of Columbia Office of Planning, and has also served as the director of development, community, and environment at the United States Environmental Protection Agency. Tregoning's academic training is in engineering and public policy. She was a law fellow at the Harvard University Graduate School of Design for 2003-04. Welcome. <laughs> we have uh, Mr. Mehmet Kaplan, who is the Minister for Housing, Urban Development and Information Technology at the Ministry of Enterprise and Innovation. Mr. Kaplan represents the Green Party in the two-party coalition government. Mehmet Kaplan was previously the leader of the Green Group in the Swedish parliament for eight years. Kaplan's objective as a minister is to ensure long-term sustainable construction and advance Sweden's role as a world-leading IT nation with focus on economic, ecological, and social sustainability he wants to modernize Sweden through close cooperation with the Swedish citizens. Welcome, Mr. Kaplan. <laughs> we also have Kania Mueller Garcia, who is the Secretary of Environment for Mexico City. Ms. Mueller Garcia holds a master's degree in international agriculture economics and management from Humboldt University of Berlin. She is an agronomist engineer with a specialization in horticulture and environmental law and natural resources 
from the Autonomous Technological Institute of Mexico. In 2014, she was elected by the United Nations Secretary General to be one of the 12 members of the UN High-Level Advisory Group for Sustainable Transport. Tanya Mueller also involved with the World Urban Parks, World Green Infrastructure Network, and Mexican Green Roofs Civil Association. Welcome, Ms. Mueller. <laughs> with that, I think we get on to the task which we are assigned today to have a discussion on some of the critical issues, though the time available may not be that long, but I suppose it would be possible for us to focus on what we need to address and, of course, also learn from you as to what are the, some of the new initiatives which you have taken in your country. Uh, Harriet, uh, please tell us about the scope of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and what are some of the unique challenges which you face in the U.S. context? Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to, uh, to be here and uh, very honored to be on such a distinguished panel. Um, uh, I work for uh, Secretary Julian Castro, uh, uh, who is the head of uh, Housing and Urban Development uh, for President Obama. He calls HUD the Department of Opportunity. Uh, and what he means by that is that income inequality is, a, is an important issue around the globe but also a very important issue, uh, particularly here in the U.S., and that uh, he believes, and I think all of us working at HUD believe, that uh, we have an, a very important role, not just in providing safe uh, and affordable housing uh, for uh, uh, low and moderate income households in the U.S., but really making sure that all the elements of, uh, of, of, for economic mobility are present, uh, you know, in that home and in that community so that uh, young people can thrive and prosper and so can their families. So uh, when I was talking to uh, uh, our, our, our colleague, uh, uh, Secret uh, Minister Kaplan, about, the, uh, about his work, uh, we've recently, recently launched an initiative to bring uh, broadband uh, access to uh, public housing authorities across the U.S. Um, and that's something that uh, was not part of the uh, portfolio for previous uh, uh, HUD uh, secretaries. Um, another thing that HUD is working on that's very, very important um, is uh, basically greening uh, affordable housing and really trying to make available uh, uh, energy efficiency retrofits of, uh, of, of HUD subsidized housing as well as uh, a, a much greater use of uh, uh, of solar energy and other renewables. Um, HUD spends about $6 billion a year on utility bills, and we'd really love to be spending that money instead on shelter, on directly uh, building uh, new affordable housing. Uh, it, it's also true that low-income households spend about 14% of their income on uh, utility bills, and we'd love for that money to be able to be spent in, uh, on an expense that might be much more meaningful to that family, that might be education or health care or job training or other things that might really give them more opportunity. And finally, I'll mention something that uh, many of you may not know, and it may not be true in other nations, but HUD plays a very large role in long-term disaster recovery. And I'll admit, when I got to HUD, I had no idea. I thought our emergency management agency did that. Uh, but, in, but in part because of the relationships that my agency has with each and every state and local government in the United States, that for uh, since 2000, more or less, uh, Congress has been appropriating uh, large sums of money to HUD post-disaster to help aid in long-term recovery. Much of that is around housing and infrastructure. Uh, in fact, HUD has appropriated nearly been appropriated nearly $50 billion since, uh, since 2000 to aid in that recovery. But most of that money has been spent, not surprisingly, uh, to lovingly rebuild things almost exactly as they were, almost exactly where they were. And in, in, our, uh, uh, in our time, where disasters are becoming more frequent and severe, uh, that's often not a very good strategy to rebuild exactly as things were. So we've, uh, we're, we're in the final days of a national $1 billion disaster resilience competition to try to really change the approach that states and localities are taking to disasters and not just focus on recovering from what la the last tragedy that struck them, but really focused on all of their risks 
and vulnerabilities going forward and designing an approach that will help them not just bounce back from a future disaster, but actually bounce forward. Thank you. Thank you for uh, highlighting all those aspects. Let me move to Minister Mehmet Kaplan. Uh, would you like us to, uh, like to tell us about the scope of the housing, urban development, and information technology ministry? It's interesting you have information technology also going along with these two other key subjects. Thank you very much, and it is, of course, a great pleasure to be a part of, uh, of Greenbuild International Summit. And uh, as one of uh, uh, those 10 percent, which is from outside the U.S., uh, it's very interesting both to, to listen more, and uh, I talked to Harriet, and it was very interesting to hear how much similarities there are in, in uh, housing and urban development, uh, whether you are in, in actually in India, where I was one year, one month ago, and met, well, met with my counterpart in uh, Prime Minister Modi's government, but also here in US. Uh, it's um, the, the portfolio which I have, housing, urban development, and, uh, and information technology, uh, consisted only of the, the first and third portfolio from the beginning. So urban development was not a part of uh, any minister before me. Uh, so that was actually the more surprising uh, portfolio. While information technology in Sweden um, is uh, looked upon as a natural part of urban development and smart cities and smart houses, and uh, where IoT, Internet of Things, is the way forward. Uh, with, a, with a country which 99.9% uh, .9 have a, a connection to 4G uh, the telecommunication network and where the fibers uh, will reach 90% within 2020 with the really high-speed Internet, of course, uh, information technology is uh, very uh, crucial and uh, uh, important part of everyday life. Um, I became one of the first green uh, ministers in the Swedish government. It's the first time Green Party are a part of the government, and uh, the current government is setting ambitious goals for an increased building rate uh, due to a shortage in, in ho of housing in many Swedish uh, uh, municipalities. Uh, and uh, even if there is an acute need for more housing, it is important not to forget sustainability and to build cities and societies, not only homes. And this is, for me, as a green minister, a very important task. And we need to provide living environments with high standards and uh, qualities. And, of course, in a country with less than 10 million people, it is easier to talk about this and... Uh, and when you are talking about it, uh, when it's much, much bigger countries, but uh, we do as good as we, uh, as we possibly can. Um, and despite the location up north, which is the same uh, latitude as actually Alaska, so we are quite uh, far north, uh, so, uh, so Washington here is around Italy, southern part of, uh, of Europe, so it is quite cold where we live, we have an energy efficient building stock and very low CO2 uh, per capita, which is the important task, especially when we only have two weeks to go to the Paris climate meeting. So from that point of view, the green uh, input is also important. Um, and the, the, the demand for specific energy use differs, of course, uh, depending on where in the country the building is located. So we have a very uh, long and tall country. So in the most southern part, it is not as Florida, but uh, at least as in New York. But in the northern part, uh, we have like uh, the northern lights area where the sun doesn't set, or sometimes it doesn't even, you know, go up in the, during the winter. Uh, so which means that we have differences within the country. And uh, having said this, the building stock is still one of the factors that account for the largest energy use in Sweden. It stands for about 30% of uh, Sweden's total use of energy. And with my portfolio, the information technology uh, added to housing and urban development, uh, we 
uh, try to uh, both monitor but also develop that area so we can uh, keep the energy usage as low as possible because this is what future generations are demanding from us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister uh, Mohammed Kaplan, for those uh, interesting details. Uh, uh, Minister Tanya, uh, would you like to tell us uh, again about the scope of the ministry? What is the area of work which you car uh, as the as the, in the Ministry of Environment for Mexico City. Uh, we also note that your city alone is uh, larger than many countries. And what are the specific challenges you have in the city? Thank you very much. Good morning to all. It's a pleasure to be here. Just to give you a little bit of context, the metropolitan area of Mexico City has 20 million inhabitants. It has 5.5 million vehicles. We have 64,000 industries, 641,000 commerce and service establishments, and approximately 5 million households. So obviously the mobility and waste management and uh, water management are huge challenges that we have as any great city, but they're also great opportunities, we believe. And within the Ministry of Environment, we have, I would say, what is a fairly large scope of activities and responsibilities everything that goes from air quality monitoring. So as we know, in the 1980s, Mexico City was considered one of the most polluted cities worldwide. We've come a long way. There is still much to do. But we have um, implemented public policies uh, in the last decades that have allowed us to improve our air quality substantially. Uh, so we have everything that has to do with air quality, with sustainable mobility, referring to all the bike infrastructure. Uh, we have the fourth largest public bike sharing system with over 200,000 users. We have approximately 34,000 trips daily just with our public bike sharing system, which is integrated to our city card. So with the city card, you can use the metro system, the BRT lines, the electric vehicles, the bike parking facilities, and the bike sharing system. Uh, we have every construction that is made within the city, either public or private, has to go through the Ministry of Environment and we define what the mitigation or compensation actions uh, that this construction has to do to, make, to mitigate the Im environmental impacts that it has. And then we have a special police within the city that is just dedicated to environmental surveillance, both in the urban area and in conservation land. 60% of Mexico City's territory is conservation land and only 40% is to urban development. So conservation land is a huge um, aspect uh, uh, for the city, for its watershed, for its sustainability in the medium and long term. And then we have, um, of course, the nice areas also as the zoos, um, the bike rides. So it's very diverse. And I would say that within all, I think something that is very important is our Climate Action Program 2014-2020 because it integrates all the government actions that go all the way from mobility, uh, public transport, construction, urban sprawl, public space, obviously air quality, and um, gender vision, uh, resilience. Uh, this is something very important for, uh, for the city of Mexico. Well, we just had our, uh, the, the 100 Resilient Cities uh, Summit last week that is funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. And we're developing the city's uh, resilience strategy that will be presented in March 2016, and which that is also within our, as I mentioned, our climate action program. So I think the city uh, is large, and with all the demands, uh, we, we, I mean, we use um, huge amounts of energy uh, normally from fuel. Uh, it has uh, huge challenges, but I, as I said, huge opportunities also. So just as a brief context, I. Um, Mexico City, the way we are working is very transversely and everything within our climate action program. Uh, we have two goals uh, until 2020 and until 2018, which is our administration. Mexico does not have re-election. So we've set goals until 2018 for this administration and we've advanced 34%. And then we have uh, a goal for 2020, allowing the new administration to, still, to, to have two years before they do their new um, climate action program. Thank you. Thank you for highlighting all those issues relating to a 20 million population city. I can understand what it is like. Um, in our country, we have some 
55 cities which have population of a million or more. So more complex are the issues relating to governance of these large cities and the, the whole array of issues which need to be addressed. Uh, if, you could, if I could come back to uh, Harriet uh, about the affordable housing which you referred to, I, I think it's, it's an important agenda for all our cities in today's scheme of things. Uh, how is it working and how do you make sure that fair housing really happens? And, and how, do, how do you plan to achieve what you need to achieve over a period of time? So uh, HUD just has uh, celebrated its 50th anniversary and uh, we're very proud of the many accomplishments that the agency has made, including really affecting uh, the level of poverty and the quality of the housing that, that uh, people all across the country enjoy. But one of the things that is absolutely a task still undone is the pattern of settlement in the United States that has tended to segregate people by race and income. And that, uh, you know, we are collectively uh, understanding much more deeply about how that isolation uh, from jobs, from uh, transportation, from parks and recreational opportunities, from, uh, uh, from so many aspects of daily life, uh, have the effect of limiting opportunity and limiting economic mobility that might affect generations of people. So the thing that we are probably more focused on than anything else is addressing that issue. Um, since 1964, this country has had something called the Fair Housing Act, and it's required uh, uh, jurisdictions that get our HUD funds to certify that they are affirmatively furthering fair housing but we never had a regulation that explained what that meant. We published such a regulation just in July, but along with that regulation uh, is coming an enormous amount of national data uh, and mapping tools that are going to uh, show very graphically in communities across the country what these patterns look like. Um, and we're encouraging localities who are required to, to submit um, these new certifications uh, under the new regulation to not just look at our federal data, but to look at local data. Um, and in fact, we've piloted this in 70 areas already around the country, and communities looked at an amazing uh, number of things. They looked at disparities in education, in, in lifespan and longevity, in health outcomes, <coughs> in quality of neighborhood, in crime uh, in, and safety, in uh, uh, you know, in, in access to things like sidewalks where people can safely walk. Uh, all across the country, people looked at very different things, but it's also these disparities have also uh, uh, been very galvanizing to a lot of communities. <coughs> Honestly, um, uh, I worked at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, as you mentioned, and uh, 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 a couple of decades ago, we passed a, a, a new law that uh, required public disclosure of toxic chemicals being released into the environment. Uh, so every company, it wasn't illegal to release, and these were lawful releases, they were, these were regulated releases, uh, but they simply had to tote up how much of each uh, listed chemical was being released into the environment by community, so, or by plant, by location. And so uh, when companies themselves saw the, the pounds, the hundreds of pounds, the tons, of chemicals that were being released into the air and the water and to the land, uh, they were shocked and horrified. And without any other requirement, that disclosure alone uh, led to enormous decreases in the amount of toxic chemicals released into the environment. Um, that's a little bit the reaction that communities have been having with the release of this data about disparities. They've been shocked and horrified, and they have begun uh, some of the most real and important dialogues community-wide uh, that might ha have ever happened in this country. Uh, and we're just very much at the beginning stages. So um, that, you know, that is a, a hugely important area for us. We're looking to support it uh, through partnerships with philanthropy uh, and through um, a, a lot of assistance to communities to both help to understand uh, the source of these disparities and the specific remedies that uh, communities can undertake 
uh, to, to address them. And, and many of them have already begun to act to change their funding formula for transit, uh, to change their land use uh, and zoning laws, to, uh, to form partnerships between public housing authorities and transportation agencies, and, and many, many other things. So we're very excited about, uh, about what is ahead. Good, interesting. Um, Mr. Kaplan, um, uh, one of your recent challenges probably has been dealing with the housing shortage. Would you like to tell us um, uh, in some more details as to how you're approaching this, especially dealing with the affordability aspects that arise uh, during times of uh, limited supply? This is, of course, a very important aspect of what a government is expected to do. Because if you look upon uh, previous governments, uh, the idea has always been that the market itself will fix this. Uh, actually, the market has fixed some of it, and especially for the uh, high-end uh, demand, uh, more uh, expensive houses and uh, more uh, rental houses with quite high rents. Uh, but if we look upon the lower income uh, uh, how, uh, houses for lower income, then we'll see that uh, the, the demand hasn't been uh, met with a uh, uh, supply. And this is what our government uh, is uh, addressing today. And in the budget for last year, we have uh, incentives for those who are building, especially for those uh, who doesn't have as thick uh, uh, salaries as, as those who can actually uh, ask for a higher demand. When it is about uh, the cities and uh, urban areas, of course, are the, something which uh, we see as a challenge to manage because Sweden passed uh, the numbers of uh, people living in urban areas many years ago uh, is exceeding those who are living on the countryside. And today, 85% of people of Sweden are living in the urban areas, which also put a pressure, of course, of, on the demand. Um, and uh, some of it, and we also doesn't have uh, social housing in Sweden. It, is, it was a clear choice from former governments uh, in the 60s and 70s, uh, which meant that uh, we can only help uh, the people with lower income to come into the market uh, via uh, extra subsidies for them directly. Um, some of the priorities for Sweden is also relating to the social dimension of sustainability. Uh, and it is very hard to count on this because it is easier to count when you build houses on uh, environmental uh, sustainability and economic sustainability. But social sustainability is much, much harder to count on. But uh, as we sometimes see here in the US and some other areas of the world also, which we saw two, three years ago in Sweden, social unrest in some areas, there you can suddenly see that social uh, sustainability uh, suddenly costs a lot of money if you, are, if you don't have thought beforehand uh, you plan actually. So uh, there we also have, when we build houses, we have the gender issues which is a central, uh, very central for the government as the first uh, feminist government, uh, which our uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs put it. Uh, it is very important for us to have, uh, to plan uh, the urban areas so that both girl and woman can feel the same secure uh, and the same confident about the areas without uh, feeling unsecure and without feeling that this is not a public space for them. And this, we believe, is a part of, of city planning and urban development. Uh, so this demand about housing shortage is something which we can do uh, something about, but we have to do it right from the beginning. Otherwise, we will build up uh, areas where uh, people will be locked in and uh, then we don't get the benefits of uh, vibrant and, uh, and growing uh, sustainable growth in, in the country as a whole. And uh, as a country which is uh, dependent on export uh, being good to all over the world, world and uh, depending on the openness of the market, we also believe that the Swedish uh, way of doing things should 
uh, actually reflect that, that kind of behavior. Absolutely, I think you're dot on the point when it comes to lower income people, how exactly to work out, and also the social sustainability issues, a whole lot of lessons which we all uh, have. Um, uh, Ms. Mueller, uh, your context is uh, somewhat different from the other two panel members. Uh, uh, yours is a developing country which uh, presents different challenges and opportunities. Uh, what are you doing uh, in terms of projects and how do you find the resources required for taking up these projects? You refer to a whole lot of uh, areas which are being addressed. How exactly do you find the resources and take these forward? Something that I think that has been mentioned uh, regarding housing, even though uh, obviously this is something common in Mexico City also, especially for the younger population, no? Uh, it's very difficult for them when they have their first job to buy an, uh, housing. So we're really trying to work on, an, on a scheme that has to do with rental that is not so um, popular within Mexico uh, or Mexico City. Uh, and I think something that is, is very important to mention is regarding all the projects that Mexico City is implementing, we depend 80% on our, on the, from the federal budget. We can only use a 13 or 12.9% of uh, the resource that we generate, even though it's 17% of the national GDP. So for example, the metro system in Paris is obviously financed and maintained by the, with resources from the federal government. In Mexico City, our metro system, we have to finance it uh, if we want to grow the system, if all the maintenance. So these are obviously huge challenges regarding public transport, our BRT lines. We have a goal for 100 kilometers in this administration. They're all financed 100% by the city government. Our bike infrastructure is financed 100% by the city government. So it's really a huge um, challenge for the city to, to not only maintain its infrastructure, but also to advance. And obviously what we're looking for is to redesign our city in a much more sustainable, human, and inclusive form uh, regarding public space, regarding, uh, and this I'm sure happens in many cities around the world, uh, when you want to, when you have such a dense transit as we do in Mexico City, when you want to include a bike lane, obviously there's a, a large uh, controversion regarding this, the redefinition or redesign of uh, the, the roads and the lanes. But we believe, for example, that uh, we just changed our mobility law, where pedestrians are, at, are, at the, are our priority, then cyclists, public transport, and then of course the private vehicles. So if we really want to change our cities in a more um, inclusive manner, in a more resilient manner also, we have to redesign our cities in such a way that they are not only, that they are of course inclusive, but are also sustainable in the medium and long term. So uh, these are the challenges we face and what we're working on in, in a daily matter, no? Right, I think that's important. How do you bring about the stakeholder integration? in all this scheme of things. That's, that's uh, very critical, and I suppose uh, uh, you have been able to move ahead in all these areas which you mentioned, because it's a complex um, situation again. Uh, if I could come back to you, Mr. Gurney, uh, since the Hurricane Sandy, resiliency has been a big focus here on the East Coast, particularly, and you refer to the, some of the disaster management uh, agenda issues which are being addressed. So how exactly are you going ahead with this with this particular um, uh, subject? I, st I mentioned it a little bit. Uh, the, the $50 billion that we had been previously allocated by Congress was almost entirely, uh, was entirely uh, allocated by formula. We made estimates at the national level about the damages and then we put the money out by formula and, the, and for the most part, states and local governments decided how it was going to be spent, mostly spent to, as I said, lovingly rebuild things as they were. Um, this competition that we're now running, uh, and we got, the, uh, we got the last applications in on the 27th of October, we hope to announce the winners in January. Um, the, uh, that billion dollar competition is the first time we've ever put the money out in this competitive way. Uh, and, we've, uh, and we've said 
we don't know what we're going to get. We might make awards as small as a million dollars, but as large as $500 million to uh, individual jurisdictions. And uh, it was a very long competition. We also partnered very heavily with the Rockefeller Foundation, who has a global interest in resilience of communities, um, and uh, really made the competition itself the, 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 the changing, the game changing thing that we wanted everybody who participated to come out of the competition, whether they got our federal money or not, with a blueprint for how they would use their own mm. investments. Because we might be awarding a billion, but states and localities in the U.S. spend billions of dollars every year on water and sewer and roads and bridges and telecommunications and uh, energy uh, generation and distribution infrastructure. Much of it, um, honestly, designed uh, and, and waiting to, for funding for the last 40 years. So much of it may be already obsolete, even before it's been built. Um, and so we really wanted people to not take that 40-year-old project out of a bag and tee it up for us to fund, but to, but to not do any of that. Instead, uh, talk to us not about projects in the first round of this two-phase competition, but only about approaches. Who are your partners? What are your risks and vulnerabilities, including things like poverty and segregation? Um, and then how will you not just invest our money, but invest your own money to permanently make your community more resilient? And so we got really wonderful and interesting approaches in the first round of the competition. Those that were able to go on to the second round, 40 of the, of the eligible 67 states and local governments, um, we then said, okay, now let's hear about your projects. Um, and let's hear about all the benefits that you're going to, uh, you're going to generate. Why would you ever build another uh, berm or a levee for flood protection if a waterfront park would provide the same level of protection and serve a community every single day and make that community better? So that's the kind of idea we were trying to really uh, embed uh, in the thinking of the applicants. And, uh, and we've been very pleased with what we've seen so far, and we're very excited for the announcements that we'll be making in January. Good. Uh, Minister Kaplan, um, you made a reference to the, the wide IT coverage you have in your country mm. and also in the cities. Uh, how do you think uh, information technology and ICT can contribute to more sustainable cities uh, uh, coming up? This is, of course, uh, uh, integrative approach needed here because uh, when planning for sustainability, then we need to take it, then we need to take into consideration what every small detail uh, is performing and how it is interacting with other unity uh, and w other units. And when we see this cooperation, then Internet of Things will be the uh, leading. Uh, star to actually integrate all of the aspects in a city where every unit is corresponding and, and communicating with, with others. And uh, here we have many companies uh, who is doing quite well in uh, trying to explain what this is needed for. But when the politicians on local levels needs to uh, take this uh, bold and important step to open up data from the national and local agencies, then we we'll see sometimes that they are not talking the same language. Um, and as a minister on national level, my responsibility and duty is to make the, uh, all the other ministers in the cabinet to open up their uh, national agencies so they can open up the data, but also help the companies, because I believe uh, here that it is a triple helix where, where we have all the three uh, actors participating to make it easier and cheaper, because this is what's happening in the planning process in Sweden today, that from a local uh, authority at the municipality level have decided upon a, a plan for building, it can take up to 10 years, sometimes more, in the bigger cities to get the building on place. So we are losing a lot of time. So through digitalization, we can speed up the, the processes, but also make the processes more transparent. Because then the society 
uh, we were discussing it before me and Harriet about the uh, uh, situation where uh, if, if we are living in a city, all of us, uh, suddenly uh, the authorities wants to a new area be built and then most of us will probably go and uh, form NIMBY groups, not in my back backyard group. And this mostly is because of the same uh, reason for many people saying no to migrants, for instance, because they don't know who they are and they don't know how to cope with the new situation. And it's the same in the planning process. If you can get the transparent transparency, then you will, uh, and digitalization can actually make it more transparent. So every step of the decision making will be more open and will be uh, also uh, easy to read for all of those who want to be a part of the planning process. So I believe that digitalization and information technology where digitalization is an important part of is one of the key keys to make it uh, faster, cheaper and actually also more sustainable. So this is the way we are working and uh, I believe that we already have seen some of the effects uh, during this term. I'm glad um, you touched upon all this and you're able to take this agenda forward, open data, access, transparency. These are all uh, critical and I think that makes a whole lot of difference. Uh, if I could uh, come to you, Ms. Mueller, again uh, about the stakeholder integration. I made a brief reference to that. Uh, are there some challenges uh, as to what the national government mandate is in this regard and, and, and what the city really wants to take up uh, in terms of um, the various projects or programs which you mentioned and whether there is any, any, any conflict between the two or if there is a, a slight variation, if the city wants to take it up in a slightly different way, how do you go about doing, taking that up and how do you bring in the people into this process? Well, obviously, um, people's participation and citizens' engagement, I think, worldwide is increasing uh, largely. And each time people are much more worried for what is happening in their cities, what projects are being implemented, and how they're taken into consideration. So for example, in the case of Mexico City, many projects that we, we do, not all of course, but we do have a process before to, to see what their opinion is, if they're, what they like and what they do not like regarding the projects, and how we can adjust sometimes the projects uh, concerning these um, opinions regarding uh, or what the people express. Obviously, um, Mexico is a very diverse country. Uh, we have the industrial development in the northern part. The, the southern part is much more biodiverse in terms of natural resources and less developed. In the city center, we have a mix where Mexico City is. So I think many times the vision of the national governments and how to attend um, environmental issues regarding waste management or regarding um, air quality monitoring are very diverse. Um, Mexico City is at the, at the top regarding all these issues. For example, we have our climate action program. We have already a program of waste to energy. Um, we're the only city nationwide uh, monitoring black carbon. So I think many times the views and the approach, uh, even though there's a constant dialogue with the federal governments, it, it can be uh, quite different because we have very specific plans already to attend the challenges. Um, and just a quick example of what I mentioned before, I mean the mobility law that we've implemented and that we've uh, put ahead uh, with a whole different vision of the city and how it has to be a city that is inclusive and for, uh, very friendly for pedestrians and just another way of mobility is totally different for what or what the federal government is thinking, no? So obviously uh, that's where you have to include all the other stakeholders like the private sector, which I think are very uh, important, and how they are visualizing uh, the, the, the development in terms of, of their businesses, which is economically. And how do you make cities more competitive? And I think without a doubt, we've seen that greener cities are much more competitive. So I think this is an important part of the private sector and how we include them in our programs, in our projects, and in our plans uh, 
because we have to work uh, with the private sector, with the citizens and the government to have very, I think, successful public policies. Good. I think we are more or less coming to the close of the session. We have about three minutes left. Very briefly, if I could pose one common question. Uh, there are many business leaders uh, present here in the audience. What is the ideal role for business to play, which, can, which the business can play, to increase impact and success in the context of building a sustainable economy? If I may so suggest in one or two sentences, if you would like to, each of the panelists would like to respond to that point, over to you. Well, I think partnership is incredibly important. And uh, I think uh, uh, Minister Garcia uh, plays a role in her city, similar to a role I played in my city uh, as a capital city, wanting to be uh, an exemplar for our country and maybe uh, certainly for other cities uh, around us. And for that, we really need to partner with the private sector. Uh, I'd like to think the speed of government is lightning fast, but it's somehow not always so. Uh, the private sector can, can move much more quickly, and I, I think uh, in almost every example uh, we, where we do uh, the best and most effective work is where we're able to harness the, the agility, the innovation, the nimbleness of the private sector behind uh, maybe a government uh, established set of goals and policies for the future, like a very strong green building law that we have in the District of Columbia. Mr. Kapla. I totally agree with Harriet and uh, because this is something which we have uh, seen upon, uh, looked upon as a very important way forward because my, my government is following this innovation-led uh, urban development area very closely and I feel also that uh, when Swedish companies are internationally well renowned about uh, finding new solutions in, in different areas. We have to be there and promote uh, those companies who are co uh, cooperating. And I was, as I said before, one month ago in India, and we found that Swedish companies, together with Indian companies, are now producing biogas out of solid waste, for instance. And this is an area where, where our government should be uh, supportive of. And so, Tanya? I mean, just to round it up, I think at the end of the, the day, what we're all looking for is better quality of life in our cities. So as public, um, within the public sector, that's what we look for, that our public policies and programs and regulations help for this better quality of life. But also from the private sector, there's uh, huge contributions that can be done. So in, if we work in a much more integrated and collaborative way, I think we can achieve these goals in a much shorter time which is, I think, what we're looking for in the general aspect. I think probably with that, we have to come to a close of this uh, session on sustainability with uh, a good number of takeaways as to what we need to do and some of the lessons which we got here from the eminent panelists. Um, uh, thank you, Secretary Harriet. Thank you, Minister Kaplan. And thank you, uh, Minister Tanya, for your participation and contribution. I'm sure the audience enjoyed the session. Uh, I would have ideally liked to set apart some time for some questions, but I don't think time permits that since there'll be time to interact um, after the session also. We come to a close of this uh, session on sustainability. Thank you very much and thank you, thank you the audience. Uh, you. Now, now we break into three streams. Please make your way now to the breakout session of choice. Thank you. Yeah.